Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Tokyo College online event. I'm Haneda Masashi, director and uh, uh, today's moderator. Today we have uh, an excellent uh, guest speaker. This is Jonika Corbett. Uh, she's one of the top researchers in the field of Japanese uh, economy. She has taught and research, researched on Japan's uh, economic performance and policy in an international context uh, at universities in the UK, Australia, Australian National University in particular, and Japan for last 40 years. Uh, in addition to her brilliant academic activities, Professor Colbert uh, assumed the role of pro-vice-chancellor, that is almost the equivalent of vice-president, uh, for research and research training at Australian National University from 2012 and uh, to, uh, to 2017. Uh, she is a strong supporter uh, of Tokyo College. She visits, uh, she visits us regularly and she gave a lecture last year with the title uh, resilience and innovation in Japan's economy. So this is her second appearance uh, on the screen as a lecturer because she she sometimes took part in a uh, uh, seminar as a as, uh, commentator, but this is her second appearance uh, as lecturer on the screen of Tokyo College. So, uh, Jenny, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everybody who's joining us online. Thank you very much for making the time to come and listen to this lecture. Um, my title today is, let me find this, uh, thank you, that's got the slides up. My title today is Japan's Economy, Changing Views from Outside. And um, I want to begin by explaining a little bit about what I intend to cover. I want to have a look at the commentaries on Japan's economy that have been made by economists writing outside of Japan in a very loosely defined sense. That is, I'm looking at people whose work has mostly been written while they were either outside Japan or on the basis of their training and experience outside Japan. So these are not just non-Japanese commentators. It includes some Japanese authors who did most of their work while they were outside Japan. And in that sense, I consider them to have a view from outside. I'm looking at the literature only in English, for the time being anyway. And I'm looking at books, not journal articles, although, of course, there is a, uh, a lot of really important work contributed through journal articles. But I think most of the arguments in those articles eventually turn up in books and we will be able to cover most of the points. And I am looking essentially at mainstream economics, not at heterodox or Marxian economics approaches, although I will say something as I go through about critiques of the mainstream view. Why am I doing this? Well, it's because I think there seem to be very few surveys of this body of literature as a group. They don't seem to be summaries of this changing perspective from outside of Japan. But I think that arguably it has had important effects on economic policy, partly through the criticisms that, that, um, outsiders make and how those are interpreted by insiders. So a form of gaiatsu, that is pressure from outside. I'll come back to this a bit more later. And I don't want to suggest that the insider views or the views from inside were any less important or influential. Um, I have written elsewhere about the reverse flow of ideas in and the things that macroeconomic theory has learned and adapted from Japan. And there's a lot of literature on that contribution. So it, this is certainly not to suggest that that is not important. There are various caveats about how difficult this is to do. Um, for the earlier periods, it's quite hard at this distance to really recover what observers were saying at the time. Mostly we have comments with hindsight. Um, 
And for later periods, it becomes even more difficult to understand who are outsiders, who are people outside and who are commentators inside because there is so much more co-authored work and because people are so much more mobile and spend time in both places more frequently than they used to. I, when I began this, I came across this work by Professor Komiya of this university, University of Tokyo. In 1966, he put together a list of English works on the Japanese economy, and it already covered 500, more than 500 items. It mostly was work published after the Second World War, although some of it was about the earlier period, but already the literature was extensive. Now, of course, there's much more, and yet nothing similar has been produced. There are some important anthologies, collections of um, work. Drysdale and Gower produce an eight-volume anthology in 1988, uh, but that is uh, literature in journal form. And there are, of course, reference lists and bibliographies in many books, and in particular in the textbooks that have recently um, come out, particularly one of the most recent in 2020 by Professor Ito and Professor Hoshi, who, from whom we'll hear shortly. And those are all very useful, but they're grouped in a different way. They tend to be about particular themes or grouped by chapter, so they don't bring the literature together as a whole. I want to talk about this in phases. I'm going to divide up what I say according to phases of Japan's economic growth, and just to remind you that uh, the performance of Japan's economy, just measured by GDP growth, roughly falls into a very high growth phase in um, from during the 1960s into the mid-70s, where growth was 10%, a lower growth phase from the mid-1970s through until the end of the 1980s, where growth was around 5%, and then a lower growth phase when um, growth fell to below 2% for this long period that's come to be called the lost decades. So I, I have things to say about post-war reconstruction, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that section. I can come back to it in questions if people are interested in what was being said about the recovery from the devastation of war and the performance through the 1950s. But let me go straight to the miracle growth period, so-called the period of the 1960s and what was going on in the economy and what people were saying about it. So in this period, as I've just shown you, the average growth rate was around 10% per year. That performance was actually very unexpected. The high growth came as a surprise both inside Japan and outside Japan. Um, and um, for that very reason, of course, it created commentary. In the early 1960s, the government announced its very ambitious program of income doubling, which it, it uh, proposed to achieve within 10 years. And in fact, that goal was achieved within seven years. So the growth was even more uh it was even more rapid than people expected. And at the time, nobody believed that they could achieve it within 10 years. So effectively, this was a period in which high growth lasted for 20 years, really from um, the mid-50s through until the mid-70s, or early 70s. And that makes Japan a very unusual example in world economic history. We don't see these periods of long sustained growth, or we hadn't at that point seen long sustained growth like that. There was also major structural change in the economy over this period in both output and trade, in the shift from light manufacturers, textiles and labor intensive manufacturers to more sophisticated heavy manufacturing and machinery. And that um, change was reflected in Japan's trade as well. So the focus of the outside commentary was largely on what were the sources of this rapid growth? How were we, how could we understand this growth? What enabled Japan to recover so quickly from the war and achieve such a miracle? Um, and that 
a lot of that work focused on measuring total factor productivity. That is the amount of output that could not be accounted for simply by measuring the amount of input that goes into the production process. If you think of a cake recipe, if you're going to bake a pound cake and you put in a pound of flour, a pound of butter, a pound of sugar, and you get a pound of cake, that's a process that's very easy to understand. If you put in those inputs and get two pounds of cake, there's something somewhat unexplained happening. In economic terms, that's what we mean by factor productivity. If you get more output than you would have attributed just to the inputs. And in this period, since Japan had very high total factor productivity, there was a lot of attempt at measurement. How do we, how do we capture that and understand where it comes from? And as part of that story, there was a focus on high savings and high investment, private sector investment in the economy. There was a lot of attention also on the role of exports, whether or not Japan was an export-led economy, and the extent to which that might have been the result of protectionist policies by government. There was a lot of attention paid to the use of industrial policy and to the role of the state in leading or planning Japan's growth. There was beginning to be, by this time, by the end of this period, some literature also on the constraints to growth. That is that the economy might have reached a turning point when growth performance was going to become more difficult. I've picked out a few of the major works that contributed to this debate. I'm not going to talk about each work in turn, partly for reasons of time and partly because I want really to summarize the nature of the discussion rather than look at individual authors. But um, I think it's useful to perhaps describe what was the dominant view and what were the chief uh, criticisms of that dominant view period by period. So I think that in this period, the dominant view was that this total factor productivity component of growth was very large, and that suggested that foreign technology was being borrowed, imported, and was being used very effectively in Japan, although there was no consensus on why Japan was able to do that. Um, growth performance, therefore, could be explained by contributions from the reallocation of labor from low productivity sectors like agriculture into higher productivity sectors like the modern economy. Um, and it um, was also it also uh, was attributed to growth in capital. Private sector investment was growing very rapidly. Exports were important but not dominant. This was not an export-led economy. So trade opportunities were important, but it, quantitatively they were not the main explanation. Um, those commentators, though, also noticed that these advantages were being used up, that they were unlikely to last forever, particularly the surplus labor uh, was being used up and the economy was hitting a turning point where labor, uh, labor surplus was declining and where wages would be expected to rise as a result. The big debate was really around whether Japan was a free market liberal economy driven by the private sector, or it was a plan, rational, bureaucratic led economy, which was the argument in the book by, uh, by Chalmers Johnson. I think, uh, I'm not sure what gives me a note. I can't find a pointer, but the, um, fourth book along the bottom of the screen there, Mitty and the Japanese Miracle by Chalmers Johnson was devoted to this argument that um, that this was a bureaucratic-led growth. The counter-argument was really in Asia's new giant that this was much more a private sector-dominated process and that the interventions by government were not, not large enough and not effective enough to be the main explanations. Um, the Kaplan book, Japan, the Government Business Relationship, was more, was midway between, that is, was 
uh, arguing that this was indeed a private sector led economy, but that the nature of the government business relationship was different in Japan from that <coughs> in <coughs> the United States or even in Europe. Let me turn then to the slow growth and end of the miracle period. By the beginning of the 1970s, the Japanese economy encountered a series of shocks. The Nixon shocks, when um, President Nixon of the United States um, approached China, there was a rapprochement on US-Chinese relations without consultation with Japan and a series of other policy changes in the US that impacted Japan. There was increasing turbulence in currency markets, a European currency crisis, and growing um, imbalances in international trade, which eventually led to a breakdown of what was called the Bretton Woods system, in which countries had a mechanism for coordinating their international interactions through what was supposed to operate as a kind of settlement system that allowed currencies to maintain fixed values against gold or against the dollar. Eventually, that system broke down, resulting in floating of the major currencies. The yen floated in 1973. That meant that instead of being set at a fixed value against the dollar, it was its value was determined in the market as a result of the demand and supply for the currency. Then came the oil crisis of 1974, when um, Middle East oil embargoes drove the price of oil up very significantly with impacts on growth around the world. So as a result of all of this going on, the, the decline in growth was not really a surprise. Um, and Japan's growth um, fell to 5%, but that still meant that it was performing in uh, relatively well compared to the rest of the OECD. There was a sharp decline in performance just immediately following the oil crisis, and there was very high inflation, but that was matched elsewhere. Japan did relatively badly in that first oil crisis, but recovered very fast. So you'd say on balance that this was a decade of good performance, but volatile performance. Again, the domestic economic structure was changing. And by now that Lewis turning point, the end of the dual economy and the end of labor surpluses in agriculture had become very clear. Total factor productivity performance was less remarkable than it had been, but it was still fairly strong by international standards. The other feature of this period was that policy operation, macroeconomic policy changed. There was more active use of fiscal policy and a different use of monetary policy compared with the beginning of the decade and compared with the 1960s. So the economy was beginning to look different. The focus of outsider comments then were largely on this end of catch up process. That is, that the decline of growth from the 60s at 10% to the 70s at 5% was not a surprising process, but an inevitable slowdown of an economy that was beginning to mature. This was no longer an economy that was growing very rapidly on the basis of a very low base, or from a very low base, but it was now a mature economy, but it was still one that was growing strongly. And so the outsider commentary was on how should we understand that performance and how should the world, particularly the United States, understand and deal with the emerging challenge to US industrial dominance. There were macro policy questions emerging too about the changes in the use of fiscal and monetary policy. This period saw the beginning of deficit spending for the first time since the war. And 
the world looked at Japan's experience or its response to the oil crisis with some interest because the response had been not very good in the 1970s, but very much better in the 1980s when the second oil crisis came and Japan recovered pretty fast with very low inflation relative to the rest of the world. So the world asked that question, how did Japan do this? The other thing that um, began to be a focus of attention was the continuing trade surpluses that Japan um, achieved and how to understand those. And there was a focus on what was called the, what is called still um, the macroeconomic balance approach to understanding trade surplus. I'll come back to that in a minute. There was also a focus on the social costs of prolonged high growth. And this is really the beginning of the concern with the downside of rapid economic growth. So there were a whole range of books dealing with different aspects of, of these questions. Uh, and I'll say a little bit as I describe for you what I think are the dominant views of the time and what were the major criticisms. As I've said, the dominant view was that this slower growth performance was to be expected. This was not a sign of failure by Japan. It was simply a sign that the economy was maturing. But the end of the availability of foreign te technology and the end of this easy catch-up process did mean that the next challenge for Japan was going to be to find sources of domestic innovation. People were still optimistic about Japan's ability to do that, um, but it certainly uh, was observed to be a challenge. The major criticism of that view was that Japan was still a follower country and would not be able to find those domestic sources of innovation. It's interesting that that question was raised back as early as the 1970s. It's still a question that we grapple with for Japan today. The other um, issues that were raised were about the challenge to to the United States and how uh, the U.S. was going to respond to that. Ezra Vogel's book, Japan as Number One, was um, really in praise of Japan's success in building a an economic system that was both socially and economically successful and was urging America to learn lessons from Japan. There were criticisms, of course, of that view. And indeed, um, the book by Hugh Patrick, the one on the left of the, to the far left of the screen called Japan, Japanese Industrialization and its Social Consequences, was the first book to really start asking the question, what is the downside of having grown rapidly for 20 years? Clearly, there were already emerging uh, issues of pollution. There were a number of high-profile court cases um, against companies that had polluted with desperately bad consequences for local communities. Um, and, but there were also issues of the quality of life. Japan had grown rapidly and in industrial urbanization had um, proceeded very rapidly. So cities were crowded. The quality of housing was not high. Public amenities were not seen to be commensurate with the level of um, living standard and income and wealth. And uh, such welfare provision was seen as lacking. And all of those questions were beginning to be raised not only in the literature, but also domestically at the political level in Japan with um, the population in Japan raising those questions too. And indeed, one commentator noted that Japan was becoming a post-industrial society in which the community or individuals no longer had the confidence and trust in politicians and in the business world that they had once had and were making demands 
for more of the benefits to be passed to the population. So it was um, a turbulent period, and, and there were um, also uh, criticisms coming from a more left position, not quite Marxian, in the book by Professor Morris Suzuki that's on the far side of the screen here, Japanese Capitalism Since 1945, contain contributions um, by a number of um, some Marxists and some others of simply a, a more uh, progressive persuasion about the costs of growth. I'm going to leave comments on Michio Morishima's book on why has Japan succeeded to a later um, period, but I've put it on this slide because it was published at about the same time, and it was looking back at the 19... 60s and 70s experience, as well as the uh, Meiji restoration period of Japan's modernization. We'll come back to that later. So let me turn then to the bubble years and um, the nature of discussion about Japan's performance during this period. And this is beginning to be something that some of you in the audience will remember. Um, you may have lived through it. Uh, this period is also interesting for the variety of performance indicators. And um, what we can say is that it was marked by the successful emergence out of the second oil crisis by Japan. Again, still steady growth at around 4 to 5%. It was a much less turbulent decade than the 1970s. There were fewer external shocks. There were fewer internal shocks causing volatility in growth. So it was fairly steady growth. There was low price inflation. There was low unemployment. The performance looked very good, really, relative to the rest of the world. The one area that, with hindsight, we know was a problem was the growth in asset prices, where land prices and stock markets had, um, prices rose very rapidly to the point where you may remember there were strange comparisons being made that the value of the land uh, that was covered by the Imperial Palace in the center of Tokyo was the same value as the entire state of California. That probably should have told us even at the time that there was something out of line here, but mostly it was seen as a curiosity rather than a, as a major problem until somewhat later. The yen was at a very low level relative to the dollar, which fed into creating large trade surpluses and growing trade friction. So this became um, a really major problem through this period. Those trade surpluses had to be matched by um, um, capital exports, that is, a negative on the capital side of the account so that the balance of payments are actually always measured in balance. What that meant was that Japan was becoming the world's largest exporter of capital. So from having already challenged the United States industrial leadership, Japan was now apparently becoming lender to the world. But these global imbalances and the um, mismatch of currency values did eventually lead to the what was known as the Plaza Agreement in which currency values were adjusted so that international balances in trade could be achieved again by the end of the decade. And that meant that the, the yen appreciated in value very significantly. Domestically, Japanese policymakers were very resistant to that happening. And once it was inevitable, they felt the need to have offsetting domestic policies to avoid any kind of um, crunch on the Japanese economy from a decline in exports. That led them to a very easy monetary policy, which further fed the bubble so that the asset prices um, were not managed in a way that 
with hindsight, we know they should have been. Something has happened to the slides. Ah, here we go. So um, the focus of outside commentary then was very much on trade imbalances and trade fr frictions and led to a period of really Japan bashing, heavy criticism of Japan as being an unfair trade partner. Um, you can see the title there of Ed Lincoln's book, Japan's Unequal Trade. Uh, and there was also the expectation that Japan, and expectation, I've said fear in brackets there, because in the US, I think it was fear, that Japan could become the world's largest economy. So there was seen to be a need to understand elements of the Japanese model. I put it in um, quote marks there. It became um, a stock description of a whole collection of features of Japan that were considered to be um, elements that worked alongside each other, and so they went together to form this Japanese model. People from outside wrote extensively trying to understand the elements of that model. It covered corporate finance and government governance, that is the keiretsu structure of companies, networks between firms. It covered the apparent patient nature of capital based on a main bank system that allowed companies to borrow for long periods of time with and give, gave them a long-term outlook to their investment. It seemed to involve stable, stable labor relations with long-term commitments between companies and labor. And all of these were the focus of outside attention to understand whether this gave Japan some kind of advantage. Um, this was also the period in which um, the first edition of Professor Ito's well-known textbook on the Japanese economy appeared. And that will give you some sense that there was a lot of outside interest to the extent that there was a need for an English language textbook that could be used in courses on Japan's economy in universities outside Japan. There was enough demand for that kind of book um, to warrant publishing uh, that textbook. The um, dominant view of Japan, though, because there were still these questions of whether is Japan a still a um, government-led or at least a not a, a fully market-driven economy, that question kept on recurring. There was a, the question about um, how can Japan and the world adjust to Japan's trade success and the need to understand the sources of, of trade imbalances? There was there were a set of interesting questions that brought these two things together around whether or not industrial policy or differences in economic systems are themselves trade barriers. Now, in traditional trade thinking, trade barriers are things like tariffs or restrictions on imports. But in this period, because of Japan's experience, the discussion ranged more widely and asked whether some of these other policy and economic system issues should be considered to be trade barriers. The dominant view, though, was still that Japan was a successful example of a market-based economy with um, macro policies being very successful in solving the issues of business cycles and of inflation. So Japan had achieved the great moderation, as it was called, that is this period of stability with low inflation. And the dominant view, I think, was that criticisms that Japan was a closed economy, that it wasn't open to import, were not accurate. They were unfair. That actually... Uh, the trade surpluses were not a result of Japanese trade policies, but they were a result 
of Japan's own savings investment imbalance. Japan was in effect not consuming enough at home, so there was a, a necessity for the outside world to absorb that extra product from Japan resulting in trade surpluses, and that that did require a policy response from Japan. Japan needed to be addressing its own trade savings investment balance and wasn't doing so. So that was the sense in which there was criticism of Japanese policy. There was also the beginning of this emergence of a, a sophisticated literature on the nature of the Japanese system and uh, Professor Aoki's book on information incentives and bargaining in the Japanese economy was one example, arguing that all of the elements of Japan's economy held together in a logical way, supported each other, and provided an alternative solution to the problem of market economies, which is how is information in a very dispersed economic system conveyed? If you believe in a full textbook model of an economy, it's all conveyed in prices. If you don't believe that markets are perfectly free and flexible and that prices include all the information needed, then you have to find other ways of conveying that information. And Professor Aoki developed a theoretical way of describing Japan's solution to that. Later, the literature known as the varieties of capitalism developed um, a different but but related argument that Japan and Germany were examples of a different kind of economic system where their institutions were complementary to each other and gave them a natural advantage in doing certain kinds of production and trade. The criticisms, of course, were, as you can imagine, that, that this was too benign a view about Japan's trade policy and that, in fact, Japan was still intervening um, in ways that were unfair and unreasonable to the rest of the world um, and that domestic policy was not, domestic macro policy was not as successful as, as the conventional view said and that asset prices the bubble economy was a, a sign that um, the use of macro policy had not been as clever as the conventional view had um, claimed. Let's turn then to these difficult remaining period for the Japanese economy, what's been come, called the lost decades. This is a period really... Um, from the beginning of the 1990s, when in response to rising prices, but particularly to rising asset prices or to the extreme levels of asset prices, monetary policy was aggressively tightened in uh, 1990 to 91 and was followed by a collapse in stock and asset prices land prices, with huge wealth losses for firms and households. So um, now, on the one hand, these may look like paper losses, that is, the value of your um, property is suddenly halved. Um, does that matter? Well, it turned out that it did matter quite a lot. And in fact, we saw the emergence of bad loans where these um, assets had been used as collateral for borrowing from banks, mainly by firms, but also by households. And when the value of your collateral um, is reduced, if the banks ask for repayment of loans, you won't be able to repay them and you will default on the loan. We did see the development of a domestic banking crisis as banks' balance sheets got into worse and worse difficulty. But this period was only really half a crisis. 1992 to 96 was not a recession. There was still positive growth. And in some respects, um, performance still looked reasonable. The second half was much worse. So in the middle of the decade, the government decided to try to restore its 
its um, debt situation, its debt and um, deficit situation by raising the consumption tax in 1996 with a very um, steep fall in consumption as a result and corporate investment declining, household consumption growth declining. Part of the reason, no doubt, for the investment decline was the political chaos that ensued in the second half of this decade when um, governments changed, political parties changed, government and within the ruling government, leadership changed on a regular basis or irregular basis, perhaps we should say, um, leading to a general sense of uncertainty and chaos. At the same time, the yen appreciated quite strongly. So on top of what was going on at home, um, export performance, export competitiveness was impacted by the yen appreciation. And then deflation begins to set in, that is actual falls in consumption level, price levels. So um, this was the beginning of uh, what became sort of shorthand for Japan's lost decade, that is the experience of deflation. External circumstances were not helpful. The Asian crisis developed in the uh, latter years of the 1990s. And although um, Japan, well, Japan suffered to some degree financially from the fact that Asian countries' um, exchange rates and their ability to repay loans fell. But more importantly, their exports to Asia dropped off. At the same time, because of all of this chaos and um, the sense that uh, the domestic market was shrinking, that cost the cost base inside Japan was rising, Companies began to offshore their production, and we began to see the hollowing out of industry in Japan, and there was a decline in total factor productivity. So from having been the poster child of the global economy for two decades, Japan now began to look very weak indeed. And the outside focus of the literature was understandably initially focused very much on the financial system. Since the uh, first signs of problems seemed to be coming from the financial system, there was a lot of literature about why the financial system was failing. Um, it looked at poor regulation in the banking sector that had allowed excess growth of borrowing. It looked at the problem of asset mis misallocation and zombie firms. That term zombie firms was one that was coined by Professor Hoshi and his co-authors. At least I think you coined it. And um, it refers to the fact that banks having lent to companies that were then unable, then performing poorly, the banks themselves, instead of calling in those loans and, and forcing the firms to close down or repay, chose to uh, leave their loans in place, hide them often in, um, on their balance sheets or cover them up, with the result that new firms found it difficult to um, borrow money and start up in new activities. And so you got an, a misallocation of capital locked up in poorly performing firms, not available to well-performing firms, and that simply consolidated the difficulties. Uh, the literature also looked at dangers of asset bubbles and busts. This was the first time we'd really seen such a spectacular uh, bubble and bust for quite a long time, since really the 1930s. And so we'd sort of lost the lessons of how important that can be. Uh, I should say it was the first time we'd seen it in developed economies. There had been debt crises and other in developing economies, but not in developed economies. Um, it raised the question about whether banking crises should be resolved quickly or slowly. Japan's 
banking regulators chose the slow option. Um, it raised questions about failures of macro policy. Why was it not possible to fix the deflation in prices that had emerged using conventional macro tools? It raised the issue about um, the importance of uncertainty when you have political instability and a weakened bureaucracy, how that affects investment decisions and consumption decisions. Um, and it looked at the fact of productivity decline and how where potential growth had fallen to in Japan. How low was Japan's potential growth now? It raised an important question about why Japan's strengths, why those features of the Japan model that seem to give an explanation for great growth performance in the previous two decades had now become sources of weakness and why even though there was quite a lot of research and development expenditure going on, there seemed to be very little value to that research. There was very little productivity of innovation itself. Um, there were several works that, that unpacked this. Um, and I think the major questions that were being asked essentially were, was the uh, slowdown in growth a demand side problem or a supply side problem. Essentially, um, if the problem was a demand side one, that is investment and consumption and exports had all fallen because of either poor policy or these shocks from the um, yen appreciation, then it would respond to conventional policy tools. If on the other hand, the decline in growth was a supply side problem, that is potential growth had fallen for whatever reason, productivity had simply disappeared, the economy was sclerotic, unable to find sources of growth, then conventional macro policy was not the answer and you needed different kinds of policy tools. Those were at the core of a lot of the literature of this period. I think the dominant view, um, certainly the one that I find most uh, convincing, I think Hoshi Sensei probably agrees with this, it, um, is that for this period anyway, um, both demand and supply matter, but uh, essentially this was uh, a demand, more a demand problem than a supply problem, at least in the early parts of the lost decades. Um, for that reason, macroeconomic policies should still have worked. And the reason we didn't see response from the economy was that those policies were not being applied um, consistently. There was a lot of talk about doing the right policy things, but in fact, it wasn't followed through. And that's certainly the argument in Adam Posen's book, Restoring Japan's Economic Growth. Um, that the, the authorities, for various reasons, complicated and not time to go into here, didn't really do what they said they were going to do. Um, but there was still a, a growing literature also about the features of Japan's economy that did interfere with the response to these crises. So Richard Katz's book on Japan, The System That Soured, and the book um, that several of us edited on structural impediments to growth in Japan, we're beginning to look at these features of the nature of the um, financial system, the nature of the labor system, and say, well, in difficult circumstances, these things slow down the ability of the economy to respond to crisis. I'm going to pick up speed a little here so that we do have enough time for good question and answer. So let me turn quickly then to the second lost decade, which I've described here as being marked by deflation, aging, and potential growth collapse, really. Um, here, this is, uh, again, this was only half a crisis. Initially, the first part of the 
early 21st century, from 2003 to 7, was not a lost decade. We saw reasonable growth rate. We saw modest inflation, positive inflation, not deflation, under um, Prime Minister Koizumi. Uh, there were privatizations of, as you remember, the post office and um, various uh, deregulatory policies were discussed and many of them implemented. And there were uh, particularly deregulations of the labor and financial markets. There's obviously uh, still debate about how effective the Koizumi reforms were, but um, they certainly uh, were there. However, and, and the performance appeared to improve. However, from the middle of the decade, things began to turn um, in a different direction. Partly, there was an early exit from the expansionary monetary policy that had been um, operating in 2006, that, that unconventional monetary policy stopped. And then the global financial crisis occurred, and Japan was hit, not financially, but by a, a fall in its trade as the rest of the world grappled with the financial crisis. So from this second or the later part of the 2000s, Japan faced very severe recession. The DPJ government was elected um, with a certain amount of chaos in policy direction. The yen again appreciated. We see this fairly frequently, the curious reaction of the yen responding in a way that you might not expect, and that certainly isn't helpful to Japan recovering because it means that exports fall. Unemployment hit a high, a post-war high of around 5%, and the economy again went into deflation, that is price levels falling from 2008 to 2012. And then, of course, there was the Fukushima earthquake, 2011, with huge damage to um, both supply and demand in the economy and a big fall in growth. So uh, a very turbulent decade. Then Prime Minister Abe was elected in 2012 and the program of Abenomics began involving unconventional monetary policy plus fiscal expansion plus a commitment to supply-side um, structural policies. And growth did recover modestly, and deflation ended in 2012 to 13. So this is, again, although the label of lost decade makes it sound as if we had 20 years of no growth, which on average was indeed the case, but it was con it consisted of these sub-periods of better performance and then worse performance. Growth slowed down again started in 2017, which was before COVID. The other features, of course, of the economy that are in everybody's minds are the growth of non-regular work and the growing inequality and poverty that were observed. So the focus of outside commentary were on the structural reforms of Koizumi and Abe. There was a lot of discussion about whether or not these were successful whether they worked. There was a lot of focus on <clears throat> monetary policy because this was an early experiment in using unconventional monetary policy. Um, and because that resulted in interest rates being effectively zero, the question about how economies operate when the interest rate is at zero became a focus of interest initially just for theoretical economists. I mean, we were all kind of puzzled because our textbooks didn't teach us very much about how, how economies work at that level. But then, of course, when other economies began to find themselves in a similar position, it became more than just a textbook question. But the other uh, focus of the literature was now much more firmly on demography and aging and on the lack of productivity and innovation, on inequality, and um, to some degree on the neoliberalism in the reform agenda. Were these reform agendas by Koizumi and Abe uh, a neoliberalist agenda or were they actually a disguised 
um, package of government interventions in an economy to to hide but use industrial policy as tools. I'm going to quickly summarise the dominant view because I want to leave time to discuss some of the bigger themes at the end here. I think the dominant view really is that, although this is still very open to debate, um, but I would say that the dominant view is that that the growth recovery at the early part of this decade and the end of deflation showed that actually in the first phase of the lost decades, the problem was, as I said before, a demand side problem. But that in the second period, really from about um, the slowdown from 2017 onwards, it's possible that what we now have is much more of a supply side problem. And that means that the focus on liberalization and deregulation becomes very much more important. Um, there has to be some kind of solution to labor shortage. One solution could be immigration. Growth um, is, is necessary to solve the public debt problem and to provide enough fiscal space to improve welfare and to support the elderly and to avoid having a debt crisis in Japan. Now, there are obviously people who believe that growth should not be the be-all and end-all of policy, um, but it certainly would help to solve those problems. And there is great pessimism, I think, about Japan's ability to address these things, except in a few places which argue that Japan, the strengths of the original Japan model do give hope for Japan to find ways out of this problem. And the books by Ulrika Shader, the last two on the, um, at the bottom of the slide here, The Business Reinvention of Japan and her most recent book, which has just come out in the last month, The Digital Transformation and Japan's Political Economy, are arguing that actually Japanese companies are changing internally much more than is recognized by the conventional view of rather a lot of gloom and doom. And that, in fact, you don't need to break the Japan model totally. You don't need these radical uh, liberalizations and deregulations that you can have a more generic, a more organic form of change and um, innovation while preserving many of the desirable social features of the, so of the Japan model. I think that at this point we can't yet say that there is a consensus view on this. It's very much an open question. So let me summarize then and then turn to some other questions that I know uh, that I would like to discuss with uh, Hosh Sensei. So let me just summarize by saying that essentially my view of these, the outside view of Japan is that initially the recovery and high growth period could be analyzed by modern economic methods. By the end of the 1970s, Japan had become a mature economy, which would need domestic sources of technology and the means to pay for a high quality of life and that Japan has to step up to international responsibilities to help balance trade flows. The bubble years suggested on the one hand, Japan was a successful example of a market-based economy, but it retained special features that supported manufacturing and export success. However, trade friction with the trade partners did need policy and attitude change. The first crisis decade raised questions about policy competence and about the Japan model, whether the Japan model was a liability. It looked as if macro mismanagement, poor regulation, bureaucratic scandals and slow crisis response had been part of the problem. These were very surprising. It, these were not what we thought Japan, how Japan would react in these circumstances. And it looked like the Japan model might be a liability rather than an asset. And there was, as I said, that argument about whether it was a demand side or a supply side crisis. The growth recovery at the early part of the 20th, 21st century and the end of deflation 
did suggest that initially demand side problems had been the issue and they would have responded to better policy. But the later part um, of slow growth suggests now that supply side issues may be much more important. Now, I would say that we're in a sense, coming back to a more um, robust debate now about the emerging, the, the merits for Japan and generally of the liberal economic order and globalization, and whether or not national differences in economic, economic organization are important and can persist. Will we see an economy, a global economy that is more homogenous, or will we see one that has a variety of different models that will learn to coexist? Japan has clearly been a beneficiary of open globalism, but I think in Japan as elsewhere, there is a lot of concern now about the downside of that system, particularly growing inequality. Now, whoops. So let me come back to why this whole question is interesting and then raise a few final questions. I'll just bring up the whole slide and we'll go quickly through it. As I said at the beginning, I think this study of outside views is interesting because it's a missing part of our understanding of the way economic thinking about Japan has developed. There are lots of studies of the history of economic thought in Japan, but they've been about insiders. Um, they have often looked at the import of outside ideas, but the focus has been at how those have been interpreted inside Japan. There's been some uh, examination of the outflow of ideas from Japan, the theoretical contributions from Japan, um, but there isn't much that summarizes the views of outsiders. But I think uh, we can see that outside opinions have been eagerly sought by policymakers um, and by the business community too, for that matter. But particularly, you can see it in the number of foreign visitors who are invited by policy institutions to come and talk to them, uh, to come to international conferences. And so we, I think we can assume that these outside views are fairly influential, not just when they criticize and, and put outside pressure on, but through a form of thought leadership, through teacher-student relationships, through co-authorship relationships, and even in recent years, having direct foreign advisors to some of the major government um, and politicians, um, Koizumi and Abe were known for having foreign advisors uh, amongst their teams. Though there haven't been any foreigners on the Bank of Japan policy board, as far as I know, which is different. Um, other central banks have from time to time used foreign advisors, the Bank of England being an example. Now, I would, I want to just conclude with some general um, points, and I am running out of time, and I'll just leave this slide up and perhaps let um, Professor Hoshi take up some uh, take up his comments. I think that there are new themes emerging in economics, which um, actually resonate with the early discussions on Japan, when people looked at Japan and said, this is an interesting model of an Asian economy that is outperforming its Western counterparts, but is preserving a, an economic model that seems to be a bit different. Professor Morishima's book was about whether Confucian thinking was the underpinning of that, uh, of an approach to economy that was different in Japan from elsewhere. It, at the time, was a very unpopular book. He was quite criticized for that focus. But I wonder now whether, in fact, those questions might get a different um, reception because there is so much growth of literature in economics generally on the importance of behavior, of identity, of religion, and of culture and institutions in helping us understand heterogeneity in, in economies. Um, mostly those works have been, have been used to explain 
variation in individual performance, but I think that they are also working towards looking at the question of do they help explain cross-national differences. And um, just recently, Professor Teranishi has produced um, a book on culture and institutions in the economic growth of Japan. It's a very long historical look. It's not very much about the contemporary economy, but I think there is potential for more work on Japan of this kind that can draw on this changing um, body of outside views of Japan. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Colbert, for your very interesting and uh, clear explanation of the history of outside view on Japanese economy. Uh, you have certainly, uh, among the audience, you have certainly uh, a lot of questions and comments to Professor uh, Colbert's lecture uh, by using uh, 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 no, Q&A, uh, you can send, send her uh, your uh, question directly. So please uh, send any comments and question to her uh, uh, from now on. Uh, both in Japanese and in English. The two languages are okay. Now, uh, we have a wonderful commentator, uh, Professor Hoshi Takeo, uh, whose name was uh, mentioned several times in the lecture by Professor Colbert. Uh, he's a professor at the Graduate School of uh, Economics and uh, assumed the role of uh, its dean now. He's also an expert of the Japanese economy he has already, he has already appeared many times in various events at uh, Tokyo College, uh, as speaker, uh, commentator, and moderator. So many of you know, uh, him very well. Uh, Professor Hoshi, please. Well, th thank you, Masashi. And uh, thank you, Jenny, for a great talk. I enjoyed your talk very much. And uh, you started out your talk by referring to a book uh, written by Professor Ryutaro Komiya a uh, long, long time ago. And uh, as you know, the Ryutaro Komiya, Professor Komiya was a professor here at the University of Tokyo, and he educated uh, lots of economists and the policymakers in, in Japan, and who just passed, passed away uh, about a month ago, I, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think it's uh, very appropriate to start this talk with uh, Professor Komiya's book, because I think that Professor Komiya was the first mainstream economist to uh, take mainstream economics seriously and apply that to the Japanese economy. Mm -hmm. So before that, there were some mainstream economists in Japan, but, but I think the many economists focused on theoretical war. Mm -hmm and didn't try to apply that to look at the Japanese economy. Uh, Marxist economists were a little bit better in looking at the real Japanese economy, but still the many of the Marxist economists, especially at the University of Tokyo, was more theoretical than mm -hmm. applied. So, so I think uh, in talking about the changing views on the Japanese economy, I think it was totally appropriate to start with uh, Professor Komiya's book. Um, you've gone through um, many research writings on the Japanese economy conducted by mainly by or mostly by outsiders uh, in the last 70 years, 75 years. And uh, you, although you limited your discussion to the academic research mostly in mainstream economics, but still you had to look at all of those books and papers. So um, I'm glad uh, I agree with you that it is an interesting and important exercise, and I'm glad you have done that. And uh, rather than um, so 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 that the rest of us do not have to do it. Or, although you know I'm willing to help, I'll be happy to help. But I think uh, you are doing a great job and uh, making a great contribution. So in my discussion, uh, I want to point out several issues that you may or, or we may want to explore further. Uh, you know, some of these relate to the last slide you mentioned. Uh, and some of these will help 
clarifying what you have been doing, uh, but some of these may uh, make your task or our task even harder. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is uh, it'll be interesting to consider why does these views by outsiders on the Japanese economy change over time? Mm -hmm. And uh, we can think of two possibilities. One is the Japanese economic system or the characteristics of the Japanese economy changed over time. And in responding to that, the outside view changed. The, the other possibility is even though the Japanese economic system didn't change, they, it retained some fundamental national characteristics, but somehow the outside view changed. So, for example, uh, during the rapid economic growth of Japan, many people praised the existence of long-term commitment in many areas of the Japanese economy. Uh, for example, in the labor system called lifetime employment system, the people tend to work for the same company for their career, throughout their career. But when the Japanese economy started to grow more slowly, that many people started to criticize the employment system. Japanese employment system is not flexible enough and so on. So did, did the change happen because the lifetime employment system became problematic because of the changes in the Japanese economy or the changes in the environment where the, Jap where the Japanese economy is set? Or did the observers or researchers on the Japanese economy uh, somehow change their mind, change their views, even though the characteristics of the lifetime employment, employment system is pretty much the same. So I think that's one interesting further question mm -hmm. we should ask. Uh, second, your talk focused on outside outsider views. Uh, and I understand you did that because uh, there are some researches on insider views, the, the Japanese economists, on the, 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 how, how the, those views developed. But I think we may want to contrast the outsider views with insider views because in many, many occasions we find uh, discrepancies between the dominant view by outsiders and the dominant view by insiders. And there's an excellent book or interesting book written by Professor Koichi Hamada recently, who interviewed uh, many economists, both inside and outside, and uh, collected those interviews. Both you and I were among the 89 people he interviewed and summarized the result. And uh, one of the point of that book is uh, he finds a discrepancy between the typical view of the outsiders and the typical view of the insiders about the Japanese economy. Most um, clearly in the question of whether the monetary, monetary policy is effective when the interest rate already hit low, mm -hmm. the, hit, hit zero. Okay. And uh, you and I think the monetary policy is still effective. And I totally agree with you that was a dominant view and probably the right view. But, but uh, if you ask many economists and policymakers in Japan, the many people argue the monetary policy is not effective once it hits the zero interest rate. So it'll be interesting to discuss why these are different views developed. Uh, between Japan and the outside Japan, and how those uh, differences changed over time, mm -hmm. where the outsiders and the insiders differ most, and how that changed over time. I think that's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. And the third point I want to mention is your focus on the views of the mainstream economics. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I, 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 I consider myself to be a mainstream economist. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think it's probably okay if we are just looking for the right view. It's okay to uh, 
constrain our search in the mainstream economics. But I think if we look at the view on the Japanese economy uh, more broadly, we can say a dominant view in the study of the Japanese economy, uh, in at, at least in some period, um, not even economics, the mainstream or Marxist. Um, so, for, for example, uh, when people talked about uh, Japan as an uh, une unequal trade partner, so unfair trade partner, the dominant view, I think, was that not, not that the dominant view in economics that you gave, mm -hmm. that there is a, a good reason why Japan's uh, trade pattern looked unbalanced, mm -hmm. but non-economic view, which says uh, Japan is uh, totally different, and uh, we don't understand what the Japanese economy is, but uh, the trade there's a trade imbalance. So one response to that from the U.S. government, I think, was uh, insistence on numerical targets at one point. Mm -hmm. So even though we, the policymakers in the U.S., don't understand how the Japanese economy works, that if we tell Give give some numbers for the Japanese government. They somehow come up with a way to come up with that number or achieve that target. Mm -hmm. So I, I I think the dominant view there was not even economics, but uh, Japan is uh, something that is cannot be understood by the economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I I think it's important to understand the outside view in general mm -hmm. on the Japanese economy we may have to go beyond the mainstream economics. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, I would love to see more of the analysis of the influence, why these outside or how these outside views matter mm -hmm. for the Japanese economy, and especially the policy making in Japan, how these outside views or the change in the outside view influences the Japanese policy making or economic policy making. And here, uh, we may want to take an even longer view than 75 years and go back all the way to, for example, to Meiji. The Japanese leaders in Meiji uh, invited many foreigners um, to learn about the Western ideas. Mm -hmm. um, the first professors who taught at the University of Tokyo, at least in e econ economics, were foreigners uh, invited uh, by the Japanese government. And also, Japan also imported many uh, foreign, foreign economic institutions uh, during the Meiji. Um, the pre-war bureaucrats in Japan who created um, the wartime planned economy learned a lot from uh, then Soviet Union or the socialist economy. And the post-war institutions in Japan uh, created under the occupation uh, directly implemented some ideas, uh, literally foreign to Japan back then. So um, I, I think it's important to, I, I think it'll be interesting to look at how these outsiders view matter. And in doing that, I think uh, it makes sense to take an even longer view mm -hmm. than you're taking here. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me stop here. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for all those really interesting uh, observations. Um, I think, uh, let me take them in order. Um, I think the first point that you made about um, asking why do we think these outside views changed over time, um, was it that the Japanese economy changed or that, uh, and so they responded, or was there no change in, in the fundamentals, but outsiders' views changed for some reason? And you used the example of the long-term employment system, which was initially praised, but then subsequently seen as being um, a, an impediment to change. Um, I think on the whole, I, I think that the main changes in view came from changes in the Japanese economy. The focus of what outsiders were interested in certainly was driven by what were perceived to be the changes in the economy. Um, 
but I do think that there is a an issue about how perceptions might have changed of certain things that hadn't themselves changed. On the whole, I think that where you see that, that's, that people are simply saying, you know, used to think something was wonderful and now they think it's an impediment to growth, that probably comes from uh, a lack of understanding and, and an in incomplete analysis that on the whole, an institution that used to be useful and is no longer useful, it's probably because there have been changes in the in the ecosystem around that institution. So it would fall more into your first category that these are that things have fundamentally changed and so our interpretation needs to change. But I think there's another reason that isn't in your list, um, which is to do with the way economics has changed as a discipline. So I think that there's also been changing focus in economics over this period that has allowed us to think more deeply about certain features of an economy that we didn't have the technical tools or the data to analyze earlier. And then, so I think that you can see uh, in the first period, the earlier periods, most of the outside commentators were people who had a personal connection to Japan. You know, there were people who lived here, they'd been diplomats or they'd been members of the occupation forces or whatever, They or they were Japanese who had gone abroad and studied. So they had a deep personal connection and a deep knowledge of Japan. In the later period, certainly during the lost decades period, a lot of the commentators are people who do not have a deep knowledge of Japan's institutions and its history. They don't speak Japanese. But the reason they're interested in Japan is that we have economic tools and computer technology capacity and data that make it possible to look at Japan as an interesting example of problems that puzzle us generally in economics. And so we get a, a rich and interesting literature that comes from that. Some people are dismissive of that and say, well, you know, this is just economists wanting to apply their theories to everything that moves. Mm -hmm. And if there's data, we'll grab it and run it through a computer. I'm more sympathetic than that. I think that there is value in some of those studies where um, we are able to think in a sophisticated way on the basis of experience from other economies and then look at Japan and ask, you know, what can we learn for Japan? So that's another category of source of change um, that I didn't really describe, but is of some interest. Um, Given that we're running out of time, I might, um, I'll just say quickly, I would love to be able to contrast inside of views with outside of views and, and this discrepancy question. It obviously, um, is a big project to do that, just to find enough examples of descriptions of those inside of views so that you can draw it together. Professor Hamada's book is an interesting example, but of course, at the moment, it's only available in <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> I found a couple of survey articles of the Japanese views, um, but it's hard work to do that. Still, it's a project we should think about. Um, uh, I take your point about the um, needing to go broader than mainstream economics or mainstream versus Marxist, that actually uh, there are views of Japan's economy from non-economists which certainly need addressing. Um, I think you and I probably agree that, that the example you chose about the trade policy thing was simply an example where people um, were misunderstanding what was going on and that Therefore, I think there is a really important role that economists generally need to play, which is to address real concerns. I mean, these are not trivial problems. If we think we have a better understanding of those problems as a result of economics, we need to get better at explaining to people how that works without trivializing their concerns. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, trade issues in the 1970s and 1980s were really big, important issues. They had real impacts on people's lives. They had big impacts on the way all our global institutions developed. These were not trivial problems. So for economists to simply say, well, you don't understand it is not good enough. Um, we have a, we have a role there, but we've got to be responsible about how we, how we address it. Um, and then the final point, um, about how these roles matter, uh, how these views matter, um, particularly for policy making is, I think, absolutely the really big question. And, um, you're right that there's a need for really long historical view of this. And the examples that you gave are really, um, interesting and valuable ones that there's, we forget that there's this long history. Um, it also needs, uh, I mean, there are various ways we could think about doing this, um, but it would, they would be doable, but, but a lot of work, but still would be interesting. Um, there are technical methods for doing network analysis of how, um, scholars and others interact with each other, uh, and those can be informative. Um, and you, of course, you can use interview methods as Professor Hamada did, simply asking people how, you know, what, what did they take away from their interactions with. So there's quite a lot that could be done there. Um, but you're right that that's, in a sense, the point of this is, does it matter? And that question is really about what in influence and impact does it have? We're almost out of time. I'm sorry. Some more comments? Mm. Well, maybe we, we take one question. One, one question? Voice. Yeah, okay. In that case, yeah, we have, uh, we have received a lot of questions. And uh, uh, I will pick up one and uh, in connection of this and uh, another one. Uh, so I appreciate the very comprehensive explanation how Japanese and foreign economists view on Japan. Still, I wish to know and emphasize two international aspects. How did the U.S. policymakers learn the Japanese economy to contain Japanese interests in the U.S.-led globalization around the 1980s and 1990s? And the, the same person asked uh, the second question. How have Chinese policymakers learned to imitate the success of Japan and to avoid its f failure? And in connection of this uh, second point, uh, we have another question. Uh, the outsider views on the Japanese economy that you have presented seem to come mostly from Europe and North America. Are you able to comment on outsider scholarly debates on the Japanese economy that is also outside the West? I'm thinking in particular of East Asia. Thank you. Um, those are, are very interesting questions. Um, on the first one, if I understood the question correctly, I think you're asking, uh, how did US policymakers learn about what, um, Japan was doing and thinking, um, in order to, uh, keep dialogue with Japan around a shared view of what was required for the global economy to work successfully. I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly, but I think that's what it's about. And I think that's a very good question. I mean, again, it's perhaps another reason, it's another element of Professor Hoshi's question about why do these, why does the outside view matter? It's not just for domestic policymakers, not just for Japanese policymakers, but of course it informs US policymakers, other policymakers, in their interpretation of what is happening in Japan, so that when they try to formulate global consensus about policy, they take that view as being a representation of what Japan is doing or what Japanese policymakers believe. Maybe that's not a very good way, of, you know, this may not be an accurate view, it's an outsider's view. In recent years, I think there's enough um, communication directly between the US and Japan that 
perhaps it's not a problem, but but it's an interesting thing to think about. As for the Chinese, I simply don't know enough about China to to say anything about how the Chinese have interpreted and learned from Japan's uh, model. There's quite a lot of literature about that. There is literature about how East Asia generally took the Japanese model. Malaysia was an example. Thailand was an example. How they took it and tried to use it and how they interpreted it. Um, but it's certainly outside the scope of what I am able to do. But I do think it's an important question. Um, and I, it's, that's also my response to the other point that I haven't looked at any of the non-Western literature. And um, there is literature, even in English. Um, I'm not able to read the literature in the vernacular languages from those areas, but there is um, some literature, quite a lot of literature in English written by other Asian economists, um, which certainly would be valuable if somebody could look at, because we, we don't uh, we lose if we have only this Western centric view. And it would be interesting to know if their, their views differ from what the um, predominantly Western observers have picked up. Do I have time for one yes. intervention? <laughs> okay. Um, one area I think China can learn from uh, Japanese exp experience is uh, Japan's experience with in the trade conflict with yes. the US. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to advertise my book with Taka Ito, mm. the Japanese economy second edition, mm. has a chapter 13, which talks about the US-Japan trade relation, mm. with what, how that developed over time. And I think there are lots of uh, lessons we can learn, uh, both, both Japanese and, and the Chinese. The Ch Chinese policymakers can learn from that experience. Mm. And now that book is available not only in English, but the Chinese version is out. Mm. And the Japanese version will be out uh, early next year. Yes. So everyone can read it. Excellent. And I recommend it, I have to say. it's um, The first edition was a great textbook, but the second edition has so many extra chapters over this last um, 20 years that have such interesting material in it that it's a great place to start on any of these uh, questions. Well, thank you very much both uh, for your excellent lecture and the library discussion comments. And I wish we had more time, but the time is now running up. Um, we received a lot of questions, uh, which I will forward uh, to Professor Colbert later. And thank you very much for your uh, participation. And thank you for both uh, for your very uh, good discussion. And we will see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.